Look at this beauty. Um, this is Things I Don't Want to Know by Deborah Levy, as it was originally published by Notting Hill Editions, um, which was September's Emily's Walking Book Club pick. Um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit more about this book. Um, kind of an interesting place to start, in fact, is the journey this book took from being um, published initially as a, an essay in response to Orwell, Orwell's essay, um, Why I Write, it's a kind of feminist response to, you know, why do I write? I'm a woman, you know, in a completely different setup to Orwell. Um, but it actually was spotted by a wonderful publisher called Simon Prosser, who's um, head of Hamish Hamilton at Penguin. And he loved it so much, he bought the paperback rights to this book, um, published it as the paperback, which you've seen in bookshops today. And um, it became the first of a series, really, of living memoir, Deborah Levy's living memoir, the most recent volume, the third volume, Real Estate, has just come out. So it's kind of an inspiring look at how one thing can grow into another and how when we think we're writing something, it's actually possibly the beginning of something else. So, well, in the book club, we all really like, well, I would say we all, I'd say 95% of us really, really liked the book. There were one or two people who were less keen. Um, we had a really good discussion. I think we all agreed that this book is just chock full of imagery. It's a slim book, you can see, but it's just thick with really vivid images that are quite uncanny and I think make you look at everyday objects in a completely different light. Um, we, ba we began the discussion both on Zoom and on, on the Heath, um, just listing all the images that had stuck with us, um, you know, just off the top of our heads. And I've got my notes here. Some of the ones we wrote were escalators, the, the piano, the mute piano that was polished every day, but never um, played the budgie and the snowman, the bees drunk on honey in a washing machine, all the containers that are missing their lids, um, chocolates, she writes about chocolate really when I'm getting kind of drunk on chocolate, um, greasy spoons, the three blank lines at the back of, at the top of the page that she can't write on when she's writing in her exercise books as a child. Um, there are so many. Um, perhaps I'll just read you the escalators image because that's like at the very beginning of the book and you'll just get a feeling for what I mean when I say it totally makes you look at things afresh. So chapter one. That spring when life was very hard and I was at war with my lot and simply couldn't see where there was to get to, I seemed to cry most on escalators at train stations. Going down them was fine, but there was something about standing still and being carried upwards that did it. From apparently nowhere, tears poured out of me, and by the time I got to the top and felt the wind rushing in, it took all my effort to stop myself from sobbing. It was as if the momentum of the escalator carrying me forwards and upwards was a physical expression of a conversation I was having with myself. Escalators, which in the early days of their invention were known as travelling staircases or magic stairways, had mysteriously become danger zones. Um, so this image of a woman on an escalator struggling not to cry by being kind of carried forwards and upwards is a really strong one. And, you know, I've obviously since been on escalators and I do um, think about them differently and... I also feel, well, I mean, I don't try not to cry, but I do also feel the kind of strangeness of being carried onwards and upwards and perhaps the dissonance of that sensation, that kind of inescapable sensation, you can't get off a move, moving escalator. Um, if in your life, perhaps, or personally, you're not feeling like you're progressing or you're not going onwards and upwards and you're feeling maybe a bit static, um, Yes, so it was a good starting point. So I think perhaps um, 
the one or two people who weren't so keen on this book, their objection, one of their objections to it was, were all these images, which most of us really loved and really um, welcomed. I think they felt slightly bombarded by them. And also as part of that felt that perhaps Levy could have um, developed the images a bit more, explored them a bit more, spent a bit more time with each one, which I would say she goes on to do in the later volumes of Living Memoirs. So, um, so perhaps she would agree with that um, point of constructive criticism. But most of us really liked that and liked um, all these images coming thick and fast at us and, and felt that maybe, maybe there is this, sort of poetry and power in in the everyday that you know in after this time of covid and lockdowns where we've been very um very used to seeing everyday objects perhaps it's encouraged us to look at them slightly differently so originally this was written as a response to Orwell's essay why i write um Basically, what she's taken from that are his four main motives for a writer, um, which are political purpose, um, historical impulse, sheer egoism, and um, where's number four? Aesthetic enthusiasm. And she gives each one um, a whole kind of chapter. So political purpose, um, in that chapter, she writes quite a lot about feminism um, and the mother and the kind of delusion of a mother, how hard it is, how impossible it is basically to be a good mother, which um, as a mother and a writer, obviously I felt very connected to. Um, second section, historical impulse. She goes back to her childhood um, in Johannesburg in 1964. Um, and we all loved this section. Even the people who weren't 100% behind the book loved this section. Um, a recent Walking Book Club book was The World That Was Ours by Hilda Bernstein, which is another memoir of South African apartheid. And um, it was quite nice to have that in our minds as we read this sort of slightly different take on it. Um, what was great actually on the Heath was that there was a, a lady from South Africa with us and she talked quite personally about how much she related to this section. Um, we were, well, I I was particularly fascinated by her portrait of Maria, who's the, the black maid who looks after her when she's a child, and her ambivalence towards Maria, knowing that um, she's, she kind of has to look after her for her job, but actually her own child and her own life is somewhere different. Um, and we really thought that was very powerfully and subtly portrayed. Chapter three is sheer e egoism. Um, and this brings Deborah Levy to England 10 years later, um, to the sort of suburb of West Finchley, where she wears this kind of crazy get up of, um, black hat with holes punched in it and goes and sits in a greasy spoon and writes on napkins and she writes in um on the napkins England again and again and again and what I found quite interesting here was that the idea of being an egoist and having an ego doesn't have to be a bad thing you know I always feel a bit feel it's a negative portrait it's um you don't want to have a big ego, it, it seems arrogant. Um, but actually, this idea of writing to make yourself feel more you, more in the world, um, was a really powerful one. And I particularly liked the way she talked about writing England again and again, um, as though if she wrote it enough times, she would feel more fully there, almost like a magic spell. Um, she wrote about feeling in exile and and she didn't like living in exile, she wanted to be living in England and and the dissonance in that. And I think perhaps many of us, um, you know, don't always feel totally at home in the place where we're living. And I don't know, maybe we should all just write it down <laughs> again and again on napkins and greasy spoons and that might um, 
might make it feel more real, make us feel more present. And the final chapter was aesthetic enthusiasm. And here she, so sorry, I should also have said the book kind of begins off the escalator moment. She goes off to Spain, to Mallorca, and then she writes a little bit about being out there. And then she delves back in the next section to Johannesburg and then to England. And then the last section sees us back in Mallorca. And there are a few interesting images here. There's this idea of um, how to open a window like an orange. And she talks about opening oranges in her childhood. And actually on the heath, I did try to open an orange in the way she suggested by rolling it underfoot and it didn't work so well. But perhaps I wasn't an expert. Um, and one thing that I thought was quite interesting from this section is a tiny little section. Um, this idea that it's about, so I'm just going to grab the right page, it says it is sometimes necessary to know where to stop. Um, and I think so often in life, we're starting or we're going and you know, we're keeping on going on a treadmill or we're starting something new, taking up a new hobby, um, a New Year's resolution. We're always beginning things and maybe sometimes we need to learn better to stop. And I don't know if that means giving up or just stopping and taking stock, reflecting on what's around us, learning to be still. Um, but I thought it was a really interesting idea and it's definitely given me pause for thought. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on this book. Um, if you've read it, if you've read other works by her, of course, she's really well known as a brilliant novelist. Um, she also has a background in theatre and actually someone on the walk suggested that perhaps that was maybe why all these images were in the book. Um, maybe she thought very visually as someone who was used to thinking about things on stage rather than sort of on the page. Um, yeah, so let me know um, what you think of this book, of her other um, novels, plays, um, other works of living memoir. Um, October's book um, to, to celebrate Black History Month is My Name is Why by Lem Sisse. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing that one with you too.